What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube where I'm accustomed to coming to you at the very least three times a week. I said at the very least, as you can see, I'm back in our home studios right here. So guess what? I won't just be taking your text messages at the end of the show. I'll be taking your calls as well. The number to call up is 888. SAS 5303. That's 888-727-5303. One more time, 888-727-5303. As always, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the love and support that you all have been giving me as my followers and subscribers. It has now exceeded 448,000 on YouTube in the first nine and a half months of this show. Can't thank y'all for the love enough. Keep it coming, and I'm going to keep on coming. And please don't forget to continue to like and follow the Stephen A. Smith Show right here on YouTube. Just click the bell to get notified of all of our new content. And while you're doing all of that, please don't forget to pick up a copy of my New York Times bestselling book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. Now in paperback, by the way, you can go to straightshooterbook.com to get yourself a copy. Today, again, I'll be taking calls, but obviously that'll be after I get into the stuff that I need to get into because somebody, a former NBA player, made news on a different podcast talking about me, so I feel the need. Why run from it? Just address it head on. You know, recently I spoke on Allen Iverson's thoughts that the great Kobe Bryant, the Black Mamba, uh, should not be ahead of LeBron James on the all-time list as the greatest player in NBA history or number two to Michael Jordan. And obviously there were people who took umbrage to that. One of them was former NBA player Rashad McCants, uh, who expressed his opinions on what I said when he appeared on Gilbert Arenas' podcast. Listen to what Rashad McCants had to say. So when I hear Stephen A going off on these rants about how Kobe Bryant is not this and not that, you didn't have that energy when he was here. Where was that energy when he was alive? And stop bringing this man who passed to extend your narrative. Yeah. Why, would, why would Kobe be in the conversation for you to kill him off so LeBron can live higher than him? Right. It don't make no fucking sense. Let the man rest. Let's keep him wherever everyone has him. If you got him one, you got him two, you got him three. We don't need nobody trying to push him down, push him away so somebody else can be elevated. LeBron gonna be LeBron. Yeah. Mike going to be Mike. We've been comparing Kobe Mike forever. Here comes LeBron. Okay, join the conversation, my nigga. But don't be trying to diminish my man's name. Yeah. Like he wasn't that guy. A <clears throat> couple of things. Rashad McCann's first order of business, respectfully. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. You don't have a goddamn clue. Period. You don't know. So let me educate you. Number one, if you're gonna quote me, quote me accurately. The receipts are there. I have never, nor would I ever, diminish the Black Mamba. That's number one. Number two, I didn't have the energy when he was here. Kobe was a friend of mine. I told Kobe to his face when he was alive because I've been calling LeBron number two to Michael Jordan before Kobe passed away, God rest his soul. That is a fact. It is something that we debated about. When Shaquille O'Neal comes on the show a little bit later on today, he'll confirm that for you. Just ask him because he likes you too. Now, I'm not sitting there coming at you derogatorily as if I got a beef with you. I got a problem with you. I don't know you that well, but I got mad respect for you. You were a college basketball player in North Carolina. You won a national championship. Okay, in 2005, I saw you against Michigan State. I saw you against Illinois. I saw you against Villanova. I know who you are and what the hell you could do. Mad respect to you, and I know you know the game. But evidently, you need lessons on how to quote people accurately and not to come across as somebody who's personalizing some kind of comments just because you don't like them. I'm not here to agree with you, just like you wasn't on, Gil, on Gilbert Arenas' podcast to agree with me. You entitled to your damn opinion, I'm entitled to my damn opinion. What's the problem? Why is it that it's hating just because I don't have him as number two all time? I think Kobe Bryant is the second greatest two guard in the history of basketball behind Michael Jordan. You can debate whether or not he's the greatest Laker of all time. I would happen to say he's number two to Magic Johnson because Magic Johnson is the greatest point guard to have ever lived. He's a quintessential point guard who galvanized the troops around him and went to nine NBA finals in a decade and won five titles. That's my opinion. There are plenty of people who would disagree with that, but they wouldn't label it 
as demeaning this man and literally bringing up his death to point out as if I'm tainting his legacy and tainting his soul, which I would never do. He was a friend of mine. I covered him for years. We knew each other on a personal level. We spoke on a personal level, which ain't really anybody's business, but those who know, know. But even when he was alive, I said, I got MJ as number one, LeBron as number two. Now, where would I come up with that? I would come up with that because he was playing with Shaq when Shaq was in his prime as the most dominant force in the game and arguably our lifetime outside of Wilt Chamberlain in some people's eyes, even including Wilt Chamberlain in some people's eyes, even though Wilt Chamberlain once averaged 50 and 25 in a season. But those were my feelings. I pointed that out. I pointed out how the Lakers ultimately disbanded because of the friction that existed between him and Shaq. I pointed out how Kobe ultimately became a scoring champion and a league MVP and in the process of doing so went back to three straight NBA finals with Pal Gasol and Andrew Bynum and deserved mad credit for that. But I pointed out the blowout loss in the finals to KG and Ray Allen and Paul Pierce and Rondo in the finals. We're talking basketball. That's it. You know it better than me. You played. You played on an elite level collegiately. You played in the NBA for four to five years. We can't talk basketball without you going on a podcast, going the hell off like somebody insulted your mama or your brother or your friend or somebody. Maybe that's what Kobe was to you. I'm not aware of that. Don't know. Not, not even questioning it. What I'm simply saying is we're talking basketball. That's it, bro. That's it. What's all of that for? What's all of that for? Because you have a difference of opinion, all of a sudden I'm besmirching his name and his reputation? I know you didn't use the word besmirch, I'm using it. That's what we're doing here? We can't talk basketball? This is the problem. This is the bullshit. Everybody in this day looking for clicks or looking for noise or just looking for something to bitch about because their life ain't great. I'm not talking about you here, Rashad. I'm talking in general. People look at things like this and they say, you know something? Oh, let me label this person a hater. If you have to pick the greatest, you have to pick one. You don't get to sit up there and say, well, this person could, what would that person could be, and this person could be. When you're an analyst, when you're a commentator, when you're an, a pundit, and somebody asks you to answer the question, you got to answer the question. Who's number two? Who's the greatest big man? Who's the greatest point guard? Who's the greatest two guard? Who's the greatest power forward? You have to answer the question. I think people talk about power forwards, unquestionably Tim Duncan. Others came and tried to throw Carl Malone into the mix. Carl Malone was phenomenal and great. Him and Stockton were picking rolls, picking pops in the open court, giving to Carl Malone and his powerful self on the wing. Absolutely. I still think he comes after Kevin McHale because from 15 feet and in, Kevin McHale personified what a power forward in that year, in that era, was supposed to be. Patrick Ewan's a Hall of Famer. David Robinson's a Hall of Famer. They were not Shaq. They were not Wilt. They were not Kareem. Period. They were not Bill Walton. Bill Walton, who if he didn't have bad feet, would have had more than a couple of titles he had, winning one in Portland in 77 against the Philadelphia 76ers where he was clearly dominant, before years later winning one in Boston as a reserve. Bill Walton, if he had never had bad feet, would have been in a conversation. Even today, we're talking about Jokic. Is Jokic the best big man? The stats show it. Efficiency shows, shows it. His skill set, we know what he brings to the table. Give me Embiid. If you told me that Embiid's durability would match Jokic and it was just about their talent and their skill set, give me Embiid all day as much as I love Jokic. Love Jokic. Know he's more efficient. Know that the analytics would point to Jokic instead of Embiid. But I'm watching with my two eyes and I'm saying this brother Joel Embiid is something special. Period. It's an opinion. Where's the person who coming in? Am I besmirching somebody's reputation? Am I nullifying and neutralizing them and I'm minimizing them like they ain't shit? This is the problem. 
all this personal nonsense and all of this vitriol because we can't talk basketball. And in a roundabout way, in a certain different, totally different kind of way, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of the stuff that I used to complain, used to complain about, because it's been years since I said this about LeBron, in fairness to him. And years since I said this about other players, in fairness to them. But what used to drive me crazy is when we're talking basketball, nothing more, the bouncing of the ball, the game itself, and you play great and you get all the hype. And the second you don't play great and somebody point that out, oh, well, you know, I just want to be a role model to the kids out there and I just, I just want to do the best that I can. And, oh, so now we're being evasive. Why can't we talk basketball? We only can talk basketball when you drop 40 or 50, but when you wet the bed and you don't show up in key moments, we can't point it out? That matters. We can't simply talk about the game. You on Gilbert Arenas' podcast, Rashad McCants, that's the podcast you were on. Say what you want about Gil Gilbert Arenas. The brother knows basketball, number one, and number two, he, can, he could ball when he was playing. He got himself in some tricky situations. We talked about that. That's my man. On his podcast, as well as face-to-face, -face, and we communicate all the time. Got number love for him. Gonna bring him on my television show, too. But Gilbert Arenas has some issues with his NBA, in his NBA playing career. Nobody would question his basketball knowledge, and nobody would question his skill when he was balling. If I sit up there and I say, yo, you were this, but you weren't this, based on what we saw, how is that denigrating? How is that insulting? How is that tainting or sullying somebody's name? You took it there, bro. You took it there. Why? So in other words, to dismiss it? And oh, by the way, I dismissed it, but not in the literal sense that you took it. I had to make a choice as to who the number two guy is. I made the choice a long time ago based on what I've seen. It's LeBron. MJ's number one, LeBron's number two. The game has started since 1947. The game is more than 75 years of age. But if I call LeBron James number two instead of number one, 50% of the people out there are saying I'm hating. I got Kobe Bryant as arguably the greatest Laker of all time and the second greatest, po the second greatest shooting guard in the history of basketball and clearly without question a top 10 player of all time. And you on some other podcast acting like I, I sullied his name. Come on, bro. Come on, man. Can we talk basketball? You talk it. Somebody asks you who the greatest player is or who's number two or who your top five is. And you answer that. That means you shitting on everybody else. Stop the bullshit, man. Just stop. Let me move on to some other stuff that I want to talk about today on the show because I watched the San Antonio Spurs going up against the Milwaukee Bucks last night. The Spurs ultimately losing the game in the final seconds, 125-121, but that wasn't the real story. The real story was the performance of both of its stars, Victor Wimbignana, the rookie, and rookie of the year candidate for the San Antonio Spurs, and Giannis Antetokounmpo, the former league MVP, okay, former NBA Finals MVP, champion with the Milwaukee Bucks, they put on a show, so much so that we should be salivating for these brothers to meet as often as possible. 44 points for 19 for 28, shooting for Giannis alone with 14 rebounds, seven assists, two steals, one block. In the case of women, Giannis, 27 points, nine rebounds, an assist, a steal, five block shots, and only 26 minutes of play. If he was pissed off about his, his you know, his, his minutes, I don't blame women, Giannis, for feeling that way. Brother just came in the league, just turned 20 years of age, and before he's had a chance to pass gas, they're already protecting him by managing his minutes. He's clearly the best player on the San Antonio Spurs right now. The behind-the-back dribble along with the dunk on Brooke Lopez, that was something special. The block on Giannis was something special. Wimben Giannis got skills. The brothers got skills. I like him a lot. He's a treasure and a tribute to the NBA. They need to stop lying by listening to 7'3", though. He's 7'5". I stood next to the brother. I came up to his damn belly. 
He's seven five. Trust me on that. He ain't seven three. He ain't seven foot. He's seven feet five. But he's got ball handling skills. He's got a J. He can create his own shot off the dribble. He can pull up. He can roll off screens and shoot J's. He can spot up and shoot threes. The brother is special. But having said that, to me, he wasn't the story. I'll talk about him compared to Chet Holmgren another day as it pertains to who's going to be the rookie of the year because right now I've got Chet Holmgren ahead of him because he's a major contributor on a winning team out west whereas the Spurs are just not good. But that doesn't take anything away from Wimbignana at all. But he still wasn't the story to me last night, as fantastic as he was and as much as we should look forward to seeing him in the future. What made the story last night was Giannis. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there are moments where we see it's not just about your skills. It's about this. That's it. It's about this. When you embrace the challenge, to me, nothing, nothing does that better than basketball. Maybe there's a few things. I mean, if you want to take pugilistic sports into consideration like UFC, MMA, or, 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 or boxing, okay, I get that part. But I'm talking about in terms of a team sport, I look at basketball that way because regardless of the other components around you, your willingness as the star, as the headliner, as the big boy, as, as meeting the new, the, the, the candidate for rookie of the year in Wimbledon, him knowing you showed up into his house, a packed house coming to watch you play. You go up against Giannis, and you a young blood that's going right at him. And Giannis is like, you must have forgot who the hell I am. And attacking you, driving down the lane and dunking on his, with his left hand, trying to attack you again and dunk on you before Wimbiana blocked the shot and snuffed it right back into his face. And them going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in the fourth quarter. This is what makes NBA action. Fantastic. Because it's what we want to see from the stars. On far too many occasions, even when they show out on the court against one another, you see far too many occasions where the stars don't want to comment about what somebody else said. Even if it's somebody that, that is potentially on their level that's going right at them. I remember when Kobe Bryant had his nose messed up by Dwayne Wade in the All-Star game and everybody was looking forward to Kobe Bryant going up against Dwayne Wade the following week on national television and opening tap, Kobe went right at him. Got an and one and, and Dwayne Wade's nodding his head. All right, all right, I see what's going on. And they were going at it. And everybody knew what it was. You see, when everybody knows what it was and the challenge and the challenge is embraced, that's what we want. That's what Giannis did last night. That's what we want to see stars doing. When Devin Booker was talking a little smack to Paul George in the offseason, and Paul George was talking about playing bully ball against him and everybody else, I can't wait to see Devin Booker against Paul George because they both been chirping. And guess what? They coming at each other because I know Paul George ain't going to back down, and I know Devin Booker ain't going to back down. That's basketball. Not all of this quiet, good feel, hugging one another, singing kumbaya to one another, and don't let everybody in on the potential rivalry that exists. Giannis lets you know, I'm here. And, and, and big fella, when be Giannis, it ain't going to be that easy to knock me off. Okay? Look at Giannis right there with his rookie stats compared to when 6.8 points to 19.2. 41% shooting to 45% shooting. 4.4 rebounds for Giannis to 10.1 for Wimbignana. Wimbignana is averaging 19-10 with 3.2 blocks per game. You're talking about a David Robinson and Alonzo Mourning and a Shaquille O'Neal is the only three guys as rookies, as big men, to ever do those kind of numbers. Wimbignana's doing that now, but Giannis said, I don't give a damn. You're going to have to deal with me. And that is what NBA action is all about. At least it's supposed to be. At least it's supposed to be. That's my opinion. But I got more for you. One of them is the Diesel himself, Shaquille O'Neal. He'll be on the show in a few minutes, but not before. My partner in crime on ESPN, NBA analyst extraordinaire, the one and only Brian Wintors comes up to talk about all of this and more. He's next, right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Don't go anywhere. Be right back in a minute. With me 
me right now is one of my teammates at ESPN, an elite NBA analyst for sure. The one and only Mr. Brian Windhorst is right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show for the first time. How are you doing, buddy? How's everything going? Thank you, Stephen A. I'm, I'm doing okay. I, I fell on a boat this week on vacation and cracked ribs in my back. Wow. So I am playing hurt. But listen, you know, NBA players play hurt. You got to play hurt. So put, I'm, I, I, I'm grunting. I, I, a little bit. Okay. But. All right. All right. You're handling it. You're handling it. We'll get into why you were in the in the islands during the NBA season another time. I mean, <laughs> I, I will get into that another time. I had to have you on my show today because it's rare that I've heard you rave about the NBA in the way that you were raving about on national television this morning when you were talking about Victor Wembanyama going up against Giannis Antetokounmpo and just a plethora of big men who've been putting on the show. Obviously, Jokic hit the game-winning shot against the Golden State Warriors last night, um, and we know Joel. Embiid is scheduled to go up against the New York Knicks tonight, and we've seen the greatness from him this season. But specifically restricting ourselves to Wimbledon versus Giannis last night. Talk about what you peeled from that game, and particularly that individual performance with those guys going at each other. Well, this was just an amazing back-and-forth matchup between them. And, you know, I was kind of influenced, Stephen A., because this morning... Um, my six-year-old, who's, you know, really getting into basketball, mm -hmm. I was showing him clips from the game. And, you know, he doesn't have a great understanding of everything. And he was blown away watching them go back and forth. It was incredibly impressive. And he was just like, wow, wow, wow. And he was putting his finger on the screen and, and pushing it back to watch them play again. And the thing I know about Wembenyama uh, is just how much he wants and relishes these moments. He wants to go up against the best players. He wants to try to meet Giannis at the rim. He wants to go back and forth. You know, Stephen A., in October, there was a Monday night in October this year, like October 7th. Right. I flew to, I flew to uh, Oklahoma City from L.A., I made a side trip to Oklahoma to go watch a preseason game. And I watched Chet Holmgren play against Victor Wembanyama in their first preseason games, both of them. And nobody cared about this game, Stephen A. There was maybe 5,000, 8,000 people in the building in Oklahoma City. The media, even the media in Oklahoma City, it was college football time. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't even, you know, the Thunder media, but none of the local columnists were even there. Right. And I watched Chet Holmgren and Victor Wembenyama go at each other's throats in that game. In a meaningless preseason game in October, they both had 20 points in the first half. And watching them trying to go mano e mano and trying to sort of show each other up. And I was like, damn. Mm. Like, not only are these guys super talented for their size, they want it on each other. Like, it's going to be hard to make it you know, a big matchup because one of them is in San Antonio, one of them is in Oklahoma City. I'm not saying it's bird magic, mm -hmm. but it's that kind of, I want to beat this guy. This guy thinks he's better than me, and I want his, well, what he's got. And I saw that last night. Stay right there when you talk about Chet Holmgren right now, who, by, by the way, is a leading candidate for league, or league Rookie of the Year honors. It's not Wimbenyana in some people's eyes, at least. It's him, Chet Holmgren, for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Where are you at this particular moment in time when it comes to those two rookies? Obviously, Chet got drafted a year before Wimbenyana, but he got hurt during the summer and, as a result, missed the entire year last season. So this year is his rookie year as well. He's eligible for the capture Rookie of the Year. Year, uh, you know, the Rookie of the Year honors. What are your thoughts about him and Wimbanyana up against one another? And what's their relationship? I hear they don't like each other too much. I don't think they do. And Stephen A., I saw this amazing moment that night. So first off, to answer your question, I got Holmgren in front because he's impacting and, and really helping his team win. He's obviously not the best player on his team. That's Shea Gildas Alexander. Without question. But he is materially affecting winning, and that is rare for a rookie. So I've got him ahead, but it's not decided. Women Yama is the best player on his team. He's averaging basically 20, 10, and three blocks. Yep. 
forget about that. There's nobody. There's very few people who have ever done that as 20 year olds. Only three. But, Only three rookies in NBA history. That's David Robinson. Uh, two rookie, David Robinson, Alonzo Mourning. I believe that was two. And I forgot who the third one was. Shaq. Uh, uh, yeah, Shaq, Shaq. Of course. What I'm saying. Shaq. Shaq. Shaquille O'Neal himself. Those are the only three. Yeah. So, and this guy's young. I mean, I, Shaq was probably about 20, 21. But you know, this guy's young. So, all right. Let me tell you the story of that night. So, Wembenyama and Holmgren, you know, they're one year apart, but they didn't get to play each other in like all the 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 All Star games and stuff, and the shoe camps and stuff because of COVID. It kind of wiped out all the events they would get together. They've only really played against each other in one event, and that was in the the under nineteen FIBA World Championship a couple of years ago. It was in Latvia. And Wembenyama outplayed Holmgren in that game. Uh, but the U.S. beat France in the World Championship. Wembenyama fouled out. And I've talked to Victor about it. It's the worst moment of his career. He has not gotten over it. And he has basically vowed revenge on the Americans for the rest of his career, mm. specifically in the 2024 Olympics. But here's what I loved, okay? So that night in Oklahoma City, they go back and forth at each other. They're going into each other's chests. One guy scores on one guy and, and does the, the yeah. strength move. One guy scores on the other guy. I'm telling you, it was, as, it was as an electric of a preseason game as I've ever seen, even though nobody paid attention to it. After the game, in the hallway, I am standing there with Victor and his mother, Elodie, who I met last year when I spent time with him in Paris. Right. I'm talking to the two of them. It's their first time ever in Oklahoma City. I'm standing with, the, with his agent. Now, I know that Victor's the worst moment of his basketball life was losing this game to Chet Holmgren. Chet comes up in the hallway and steps in and introduces himself. He says, hello, hi, Victor. He, already, he knows Victor. Um, and, and Victor says, oh, hi, this is my mom. And Chet meets his mom. And his mom's like 6'4", Stephen A. I'm right. the shrimp. Okay, I'm way below <laughs> okay. everybody here. And, Victor, and Chet says, you know, I played Victor once before. We played last a couple of years ago in Latvia. Stephen A., this would be like Donald Trump running into Hillary Clinton with Bill Clinton there and saying, oh, you remember I ran against Hillary in 2016. You're talking <laughs> about like the defining moment of his basketball career. Right. I think he's given him the needle, Stephen A. Mm. He's... He's giving him the needle, all right? And I loved it. And his mom goes, I remember. Wow. You know, like, by the way. So then I, I never met Chet. So I introduced myself to Chet. I'd known Victor for a while at that point. I introduced myself to Chet. And Chet smiles and he goes, I look forward to talking to you for the next 20 years. Mm. And walks away. I love that. Now, he doesn't talk like that always out on the court, but I'm telling you, they want to beat each other and they want to be known as the better player. Mm -hmm. This rookie of the year race, you won't see them talk about it necessarily in the media because they're not really into that, but it's personal. And I love it. And it's a part of this class mm -hmm. of giants like Embiid and Jokic who are dominating the league like we've never seen before. Let me transition away from the rookies right now because that's a story that's not going away. Wimby is the real deal. He's a big-time talent, no doubt about it. Very impressive, goes after it. I love how he's in attack mode. I love how he went after Giannis last night. Chet Holmgren, I've been watching him all season. I love what I'm seeing from him. And I think Oklahoma City is a team that we've got to discuss because they are something to be reckoned with. But let's stick with Giannis in Milwaukee for a second here because this dude is a superstar. I think we played like one last night, showed the mentality of one last night. But they have had their problems, losing four or five games this season to the Indiana Pacers, showing an inability to defend against teams who go small against them. Although they're the number two seed in the Eastern Conference, when you look at Milwaukee at times this year, clearly Boston could beat them. But you have to look at Philadelphia. You have to look at Miami. You can't underestimate them. What are we to make real quick of the Milwaukee Bucks based on what we've seen from them thus far this year? Well, I think that they're – so gifted and so awesome. And I think Dame has been exactly what the doctor ordered and they are a powerful team, but in the, the modern NBA in 2023, 24, with the way they are calling the game, 
if you don't have size on the perimeter, you can't defend. You, it, you, you just aren't going to be able to give these big, long, lanky teams problems. This is one of the things that the Nuggets won. I mean, look, the Nuggets won the title because they got Jokic. Right. But you look at the Nuggets, they're huge. They have great size everywhere. You know, maybe not Jamal Murray, but you right. look. Porter, got, you know, Aaron Gordon, absolutely. Michael Porter, Kentavious Caldwell Pope. Right. I mean, even the guys they bring off the bench, you know, they got great length. Boston, look at the length that they got in that perimeter. And, you know, Drew Holiday plays bigger than his size. Right. You look at Minnesota, which, by the way, is being built by the same guy who built the Nuggets, Tim Connolly, went over there. Right. The transactions that he's made since he's got there have been either to acquire length or retain length. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because he knows how but, much how much size you got to have. Milwaukee doesn't have that size, Stephen A. And so my concern is, at the highest level, can they survive a four playoff series? I'm not saying that they can't win a couple. Can they win four playoff series without having that length? The answer is no. The answer is no. I, I mean, it's a simple no for me. And Bob, by the way, I'll still take it to that place with, with Minnesota because I think Rudy Gobert is a liability come postseason times when teams want to go a bit smaller. But I love seeing Anthony Edwards. As much as I can see Anthony Edwards, I want to see Anthony Edwards. Let's stay in the Eastern Conference for a second, though. Boston being a team that's jacking up threes, over 43 or 44 threes per game. Is that sustainable? Is that going to be what's going to propel them to the to the NBA Finals? I'm not sure about that, Wendy. I've been in arguments with it, with, about with people with this, Stephen A. Because I think they shoot. I think Jason Tatum, who's six foot nine, incredible, uh, uh, you know, creativity with both hands going to the basket, should never allow teams to get bailed out by him taking long jumpers. Now he can create space because of his size. Right. It's the same concept of Kobe Bryant. When Kobe would go for last minute shots, he was going to create that space because he could do with his footwork and that's who his hero is. But, and the thing about it is Joe Missoula, their coach, this is what he's coaching them. He wants them taking these shots. Mm. You know, this is not them freelancing. This is the way he wants to run it. And, you know, I got people saying, this is the way you got to play. If you've got an advantage on the three-point line and you're 4% you're advantage per game, you get those suckers up. And, but I sit there and watch Tatum and I go, at the end of these close games, I want to see Jason Tatum applying pressure to that defense. I don't mm. want to see him bailing them out by taking an off-balance jumper. So got it. I agree with you. I say they take too many threes, but I'm not I'm – not, you know, I'm not the, the majority may not be on our side, especially on mm. that coaching staff. I'll go out west. Let's go back out west because I'm looking at the Denver Nuggets and they're clearly the favorites. They're the reigning defending champions. We don't show them enough res enough respect by talking about them as much as we should. But that's basically because it's a foregone conclusion. Jokic is the best in the game at this particular moment in time. In a lot of people's eyes, they're the reigning defending NBA champions. Like you alluded to, the size that they have available to them, that's something to behold. When I look at the threats in the, in the Western Conference, we assumed it would be the Lakers. We we assumed it would be the Clippers, who are very, very relevant, by the way. We assumed it would be the big three in Phoenix. And lo and behold, we're sitting here today in the top two teams of the Minnesota yeah. Timberwolves and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Real quickly, Wendy, how do we explain that? Well, because defense. The, because, you know, in this era where nobody defends, if you can defend, it makes a difference. And the Timberwolves defend. And you may be right, Rudy Gobert might be able to be targeted uh, when you get into playoff settings. But look at Minnesota. They're huge. You know, they got Jalen McDaniels out there. He kind of plays like Aaron Gordon. They got Anthony Edwards, who plays taller than his, uh, than his size, and he wants to defend. They have, you know, multiple seven-footers that they start. They bring another giant guy off the bench in Nas Reed. They are built to defend. And one of the biggest transactions that's happened in the last year, Stephen A., was them acquiring Mike Conley. Mike Conley has changed that organization. And look, it's, there's other stuff going on. Gobert is more settled. Ant yeah. Edwards has become a superstar. Right. Mike Teammates Conley ain't fighting down. with each other. They ain't fighting with each other now on the sidelines. None, none of that's happening. Not so far. And Gobert seems to be calmed down. And he and, and he and Towns seem to have settled into a rhythm. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But they defend. They're the number one defensive team right. in the league. God, by the way, Boston's number two. Right. Who are the best two teams in the league? Boston and Minnesota. You still got to defend in mm. the NBA if you're going to win at the highest level. When, I believe that. But, but not everybody does anymore. Wendy, I got to get ready to rush out of here in a couple of minutes. But let me ask you this question real quick. If I started out this season and I said to you, when we're talking about playoff contenders, none of them would include a team with LeBron James on it or Kevin Durant on it, what would you have said? Well, I would just say the Suns haven't had their guys. I mean, I think they're going to need 20 games before you can even evaluate them. They've had like four. So, like, I, I have to give the Suns a pass. Here's the thing about the Lakers. They got a problem. Their problem is, is that their roster has shown that it can work. They've shown that they can defend at a high level. They've shown that their two superstars can, can carry them at a high level. But it's not working. They can't make a shot, and the, and the collection that they have isn't working. So if you're Rob Palinka, you got a challenge here. Do you trust what you've built? Do you trust that team that got to the conference finals last year? Do you trust the team that in the in-season tournament this year, you can qualify their opponents and however you want to qualify it? They played awesome. They played awesome defense, and they were great executing when they, when they needed to. They dominated that play-in tournament or that uh, in-season tournament. How do you decide which is which? And so to me, I would have to say they got 12 games here, the Lakers do. They played one of them. Ten of their next 11 are in Los Angeles. Two road games. One of them is against the Clippers. They're, they stay here. Mm -hmm. At the end of that, it's the end of the month. Where are the Lakers? Are they five, six games back above 500? Right. They've got the ship righted. Or are they three, four games under 500? I that is where you're going to see a big, giant thing. And we're watching LeBron, Stephen A. LeBron's already starting to, you know, he's... Yeah, he's moody. He's moody. He's got an attitude because – and he, I, I don't blame him because his players, his teammates have betrayed him because other than Anthony Davis, nobody else has really, really shown up. But I don't want to hear these rumors, any validity to these rumors that Darvin Ham could be on the chopping block, that he could lose his job. That's insane to me. The man just took them to the Western Conference Finals in his first year as the damn head coach. And when you look at it from that perspective and see that the struggle has been what it is this year, it's early, but you still got plenty of time to right the ship. What is this about? Well, obviously the Lakers, and, and this isn't even, you don't even need sources here. The Lakers players have openly said that the changing rotations have frustrated them. Uh, Darvin has had to change the starting lineup. I think he's had to use 10 different lineups. Some of that's been because of injuries. But he hasn't used the lineup that they used most of the playoffs last year, which right. was Reeves, Russell, and Vanderbilt all in the starting lineup. And I think that's frustrated the locker room. But I'm going to tell you, Rob Palinka who is the guy making the decisions. Now, he can be influenced by LeBron James. He can be influenced by, you know, G other folks. Jeannie Buss. But Rob, yeah. Rob, Jeannie, obviously. But Rob Palenka believes that this roster can work, and he believes, and I mean really believes in Darvin Ham. He made the hire. It was his call. He, uh, you know, really believes in the way he carried them through last season's struggles, and he appreciates the way he got the team to play in the in-season tournament this year. Right. So I do think that there's some pressure on Darvin to find a lineup that not only works, but keeps some more of the guys happy. But Rob Palinka believes in this roster. He's the guy who put it together. And so that's important. While anybody speculates about what they're going to do, remember that the guy making the decisions likes what he's put together. And he learned a lesson from that Russell Westbrook trade which was he traded three guys on a team that was good and had good depth and had proven itself in the playoffs for one, chasing something, and it blew up in their face. So when you put together these Donovan, these uh, DeJounte Murray and Zach Levine trade yeah. scenarios and it's three or four for one, nope, that ain't the way the He's Lakers want to roll. Listen, man, I appreciate your time, buddy. I will talk with you about the Knicks another time. I know they got OG and Anobi. They've improved defensively. We know defense wins come playoff time, but obviously you got to be able to score points too. I'll get on you about that another day, and I'll talk to you another day about the Los Angeles Clippers, who I think got a shot to get to the NBA Finals. If Kawhi Leonard stays healthy, that's good Lord, miracles happen. Okay, Paul George stays healthy. Who knows what the Clippers could do? But until then, we'll talk another time. Wendy, I appreciate your time, buddy. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Have a great weekend. All right. Right, buddy, you do the same. The one and only Brian Wintos. Remember, Brian Wintos in the Hoop Collective, his podcast, all on Apple Podcasts, all over the place. The man knows his basketball. Really appreciate him taking the time to show up and join me here. Up next, he is the Diesel himself, the one and only Shaquille O'Neal. He's up next with your boy Stephen A. Right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show.
over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show, everybody. It's my honor and privilege to have my next guest here with me. You've known him as the big Aristotle, the big fella, the diesel. I also know him as this jokester calling himself Tex Johnson and all of this stuff. This big cowboy thing getting on my damn nerves all the damn time. The one and only Shaquille O'Neal is in the house. What's up, man? How you doing? First of all, you're not talking to Shaq. You are talking to Tex Johnson. And uh, I got this cowboy hat. I just put it out the box for you, baby. Oh, my Cowboy Lord. Nation, here we go. <laughs> uh, that's that pathetic. That's Prescott, what you doing, baby? You ain't even no Cowboys here fan. Go, Cowboys, here we go. What, what, why are you doing here this? Here we go, Cowboys, here we go. Why are you doing this? You're not a Cowboys fan. You just do it to mess with. Uh, are you a Cowboys I was, fan? I was born and raised a Cowboys fan. Before I started playing basketball, I used to tell everybody that two tall girls with my father. Shout out to Two Tall Jones. No Stop doubt it. about it. But let me ask you this question. You acting like they're going to win the Super Bowl this year. Is that what you're trying oh, to say are. right here? We are. Oh, really? We are. Oh, so you one of those. you one of yeah, those. I, You've been saying I, that every I'll year? I'll I tell you what. I live on a 50-acre farm here right now down here in Texas. If they don't win, if they don't win the Super Bowl, you can have my farm. I will bring – listen – here, here is the paper to Tex Johnson's farm. If we don't print the damn Super Bowl, you can have it. You can have the deed well, I, and the trust. It's I'm all about yours. to own a farm. You know, ain't no way in hell y'all beating San Francisco. And if you're lucky enough to get out of the NFC, you ain't beating Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens. Cowboys forever. Let's go, Dak Prescott. I believe in you, Dak. Oh, please, did you? Let me go to basketball, okay? You made news the other day. I believe you were on your podcast. You were talking about... Chet Holmgren, somebody was talking about, I, I think it was your guy, Lefko, he was talking about Chet Holmgren, and you stopped him because he used the word phenomenon. You said you didn't want to hear about that all the time. Let's stop giving these guys these kind of accolades before they earn it. Elaborate on that for a second, because a lot of people wanted to hear what you had to say about him and today's big men. You know, in this era we live in today, a guy's coming with a lot of hype. And, what, and listen, I'm guilty of it, too. I'll show you all my good clips, and I'll post it. You know, making me seem better than I am. You know, he's he's a good player, but listen, he's not he's not up there with the KD. He's not up there with the LeBrons. Will he? I say hell yes at some point in his career, in two or three years. But right now, let, let's not put all this pressure on these kids. He's a good player. Let's just you know leave it at that. Are you talking about Chet Holmgren, Victor Wembanyama, or all of them? All of them. You know, they're listen. It's, it's only. There's only one or two guys that came into the league right away and made an impact. You know, everybody else had to work. You know, again, uh, you, know, our, you know, our good friend, the late great Kobe Bryant, as great as he was, it took him about maybe a year, two years to become the Black Mamba. So, listen, these guys are doing fabulous. I love that game. Victor Wimbledon had an unbelievable game last night. But let's not put too much pressure on this kid. He's a rookie. And I, I said last night, I stressed last night, even though they're not winning, as an individual, he has to continue to get better. Because at some point, when, you know, KD leaves and when LeBron leaves and when Giannis is get, gets over, older, he's going to be the future of the league. And hopefully by then, he's averaging 28, 30. And then we can say he's a phenomenon. So, you know, I, I just think we're putting a lot of, you know, pressure on, on these kids. My problem with what you're saying is, why are you so protective of them from, from the pressure? You came into the league, you had the pressure. LeBron came into the league, he had the pressure. MJ came into the league, he had the pressure. Olajuwon, Ewing, a whole bunch of people came into the league, whether they were big men or not. They had the pressure, y'all had to deal with it. Why sit up there and coddle these guys from that pressure? You want it, here it is. This is the pressure that comes along with it. What's wrong with that? Because I am the president of the Big Man Alliance, Joker is the vice president, and Joel Embiid is the treasurer. I will always protect my big guys. These guys are fabulous, but you know I'm 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 always trying to protect them. Even 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 when I criticize them, I'm just trying to give them information, you know, to protect them. These guys are fabulous players, and they continue to get better. But let's not put the oh, he's the greatest big man. Let's not put that on them right now. Give them time to, you know, develop. Because if you put that on them now mm -hmm. and they don't reach that, you're going to kill them. I'm going to kill them. Barkley's going to kill them. So I'm saying let them, let them earn it. Let them earn want, it before we, before we give them KD status. See, KD, is K, KD is KD because he's earned it. That's true. That's right? true. No but, question. But, he definitely has earned it. But let yeah. me ask you this question because I'm kind of shocked that you call them big men. Embiid's a big man. Jokic is a big man. 
Yes. Wimby Young is tall. Chet Holgren is tall. Combined, they don't weigh as much as you. I mean, that, to me, they ain't big men. They just tall what? dudes. KD seven feet. He ain't a big dude. Why should they be considered a big dude? They just as skinny as him. I can't believe you of all people didn't pick up on the weight factor in all of this, the girth. Yeah, but my good friend Kevin Garnett said something interesting. He said, we're so focused on what it used to be. Mm. We need to focus on the now. And I, I kind of said that because KG's a good friend of mine. Yeah, yes. good and I agree with him. So we don't have any big 350s anymore. This is what we have now. So this is what we have to, you know, look at. This is what we have to be proud of. So I'm going to embrace these guys. Uh, and then again, you know, me, big guys, four and five. You know, po power four. Mm -hmm. Not the stretch four. Right. Keep them over there with the guard. But the power four, <laughs> you know, the Zions and, and the fives. And guess what? Don't forget about my boy, Bowl Bowl. Bowl Bowl is there you coming. Go. Bowl Bowl, that's what we do. That's what we doing now. Bowl Bowl is coming. Next Johnson Bowl. Oh Bowl, my Bowl. God! Stop it! I just stop it. Just stop it. Let me ask you this though: as we sit, as we, as we sit here today, we look at Jokic. Some would say he's the best big man in basketball. Obviously, has the credentials. He's a reigning, defending NBA champion. We know what numbers, what level of efficiency he brings to the table. But I gotta tell you, Shaq. When I look at it from a talent perspective and I see this brother Joel Embiid balling the way that he has balled, the skill set that he has at his size, there are very few people on the planet that have been able to be what Joel Embiid is. How do you compare those two big boys? And they're big they're boys. Both, they're both great players. But if Joel doesn't win, you're going to kill him. You. Yeah. Your show. Yeah. You, Big Perk, J.J. Reddick. Right. Joker has that edge. He's won, right? Right. So, you know, even though, you know, the numbers are, are different. And I uh, I had an interview the other day, and I, I can remember having similar, lesser numbers than Joel Embiid. And they asked the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, what do you think about Shaq? And his response was, he's pretty good, but he hasn't won yet. Mm -hmm. Kind of broke my heart, but it was the truth. Listen, Joel Embiid is a fabulous talent. Definitely number one, number two. But if he doesn't win in this world we live in, you're going to kill him. Well, listen, I did, I did it to you. Hey, I, which, I told hey. you you had to win. You remember you that conversation? You, 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 you did. You did. And you know, listen, I, like I said, I, I, I had similar numbers. But until you win, I mean, I I know what Joel is going through. And, you know, I, I definitely want him to win because he's he can do it all. He's a great player. What does it take, though, Shaq? Yeah. What, what, what's the, there's an ingredient that comes with it because you can't do it by yourself. And we know from a skill set and from a numbers perspective, Joel B puts up the numbers. I told you, you called me and we were talking about this the other day. When you had Penny and those boys in Orlando, you didn't win yet. You got to the finals, but you lost to Houston. You didn't have, you had Eddie Jones in L.A., but you didn't win. And then Kobe came and ultimately developed, and then y'all three-peated. What is it going to take for Joel B to capture a championship in Philadelphia? Well, Joe's going to have to be Joe, and that 34 that he's averaging during the regular season, he's going to have to maintain that, probably add three, four, five onto that. Mm. Max, Max is going to have to step up. So you, def, you need a one-two punch. But the key is one of my favorite players, Tobias Harris. He's going to have to, he's going to, have to be very, very consistent. You've heard me say many times, and I will always say it, I would not have four championships without Brian Shaw, Rick Fox, Robert Ory, Antoine Walker, James Posey, Udonis has them. The others are going to have to step up and be special. Like for, I, I don't know what, like, you know, Tobias averages now. Let's just say he averages 15. If you can average 20, Mr. Tobias, or 21 or 22, now you're talking. He's got to like, be more aggressive. He's got to he be more aggressive. He does. But, but you brought he up Ory. You brought up Brian Shaw. You brought up the Rick Fox of the world and others. Let's transition because they were all wearing Laker uniforms as well, along with you and Kobe. We look at the Lakers today. I've been on the record. I think the players have betrayed LeBron James and Anthony Davis. They ain't doing a damn thing. I mean, we on the digital airways of YouTube. They ain't doing shit. It's just that simple. I'm looking at them right now. I'm talking about the rest of the Lakers. I'm not talking about Darvin Ham, the coach. I'm not talking about Palenka, who assembled the squad. I'm looking at Anthony Davis averaging 30 and 12, ain't missing games this year. I'm looking at LeBron James averaging 25 plus, and I'm seeing the D'Angelo Russells, the Hachimoras of the world, the Austin Reeves of the world, who was averaging 17 as of late, and others. And I'm like, they not, they not stepping up. It's like they got comfortable because of the Western Conference Finals appearance. What do you make of what you're seeing from the Lakers? Well, after the the 
the raising of the accoladed banner, not a real banner right. after that. In season banner. In season. Yeah, yes. In, in season banner. Just been playing different. And they what they have to realize, they have to take advantage of their opportunities. The pressure is on LeBron and AD, but as a professional player, if a guy's leaving you wide open, you have to step up. Rick Fox and Derek Fisher used to be pissed off that they missed open shots. They knew they had to knock those down. So, again, the others have to step up. Listen, you got AD playing fabulous. I'm on AD's case all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, LeBron playing, but Reeves got to play spectacular. D'Angelo got to play spectacular. Uh, Rudy Hachimori got to play spectacular. And they have to take advantage of it. You play with two of the greatest players ever. You have room to operate. So mm. if you got room to operate, be aggressive and operate. You can't always wait on them. Sometimes you got to do it yourself. But, you know, the others have to step up. You know, Charles always talk about the others don't matter. Right. You need others to win championships, period. I, I said this on TV the other day. I said, if I'm the Lakers, if I'm Jeannie Buss, if I'm Rob Palink or somebody, I take those other dudes, not Anthony Davis, not LeBron James, but the other dudes, and I drive them around L.A. I make sure the sun is shining. There's about 80 degrees outside. I say, you want to be here? You, you, you want to go somewhere else or you want to be here? Because if you want to be sir. here, you're going to need to produce. I think you throw that in their face and use the California sunshine and the lifestyle of threaten to take it away from them. Do you like that strategy? I love that strategy. And they realize you have, you, you have to take pride, pride in when you are. You know, I always keep shouting my others because they, they took pride. They took pride of holding me responsible, holding Cobra responsible. They took pride of like, hey, man. You like, hey, you're asking us to do this. You need to do this, Shaq. You need to do that. And so, like, we all we all held each other accountable. But yeah. the other guys have to step up. Like, I, I would, I would, I would love to be a guy out there with people not respecting. And I get to showcase my talent. Like, that would just make my make my blood yeah. boil. Like, oh, you're not gonna stick me, and I can shoot a little bit. I'm gonna knock out every shot. I'm gonna make a name, make a name for myself in L.A. playing with LeBron and AD. Please, you, you know what they're gonna say. LeBron, AD, and that dude Shaq, boy, Shaq, Shaq <laughs> nice. Shaq who is remind, nice. Who reminds you of you most in today's game? I'm gonna have to go with Giannis. I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually jealous of today's big man. I wish I was able to take out and go coast to coast. Like I did it every now and then, but I would get in trouble by the coach. But <laughs> now it's like, now it's like you know, Joker getting it and calling plays and calling for screens and doing backdoor cut. Like, I I had that ability. I wasn't able to showcase. So I'm, I'm definitely jealous of today's big man. But to answer your question, Giannis, because when he puts his head down, he's going to run you over. Your, that's top, what your top five young stars in the NBA right now. Because I'm thinking guys like Anthony Edwards, to give you an example. Your top five young stars. Is Giannis still young? Nah, we ain't going with him. He got a championship okay. in the league for about eight, nine years. Okay, cool. I'm talking All about right. some of the young bloods right now. Uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander, even though he's been around for a little while. Shea Gilgis Shea. Alexander, Anthony Edwards, that kind of thing. Yeah. Hey, hey, man, you you you, you going to let me answer? Go ahead. Man. You know I'm what? I'm sorry. You don't sorry. respect me. <laughs> the time to go to my boy. <laughs> uh, Shea, definitely. All right. Anthony Edwards is a who. Oh. I, I like Anthony Edwards. Special. And, and I like my boy. Ah, 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 ah. I like Trey. I, I, I like uh, Ice Trey. Okay. I like Wimbanyana at the five. Really? At the four, I'm going to go with, hope I'm not saying his name wrong. Hakim, ha Miami. Oh, Hakim. Uh, Jaime, Jaime Hakez. Yes. Jaime and, uh, Hakez. Uh, coming, He's really and, gone, uh, though. Coming off the, yeah. And coming off, the, coming off the bench, Alfred Sangoon in Houston. Oh, yes. That's I a good like one. Him. That's a good one. And I'm going to throw my boy Zion in there. Zion, he, really? He, he, really? Yeah, yeah. Hold on. Hold on. I know what he can do. I have yes. no questions about his skill set. Yes. Just the and, desire and, on oh, a night in, night out basis. And, and that's the point I was going to make. As soon as he decides to turn that switch and leave it on, he's going to be a problem. Shaq, before I let you go, I had to address a little bit earlier in the show this cat, Rashad McCann. 
out of North Carolina. You remember him, played in the league for about four or five years. Okay, won a national championship at Carolina in 2005. Wasn't no scrub or anything like that. The brother got mad at me. I don't know him, but he got mad at me because I was like, listen, I love Kobe, miss him to death. The black mama's the black mama, but I did not have him number two all time. And oh, because of that, I'm hating. I, I was like, is, is there something wrong with today's culture? Like, you, you, if you tell us, I'm thinking Kobe Bryant's top 10 all time, probably top five. I mean, look, number two off guard all time behind Michael Jordan. In my mind, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, wait a minute, what's wrong with me not saying it? He's not number two all time in the history of basketball. What's wrong with that, Shaq? We have to sometimes be able to stop time and get out of our own way. Everybody's going to have a different opinion. Yeah. Right? Some people like this shirt. Some people hate it. Some people think it's old school. But we have to, just because you have an opinion, doesn't mean you're right or wrong. And just because you have an opinion, doesn't mean we have to get into a verbal altercation. Right. Now, one, th one thing I know about you, one thing I know about him, one thing I know about me, is once we say what we say, we're going to stand on it. But again, I had to learn how to get out of my way. Like, I hear all the time the GOAT conversation. Sometimes my name comes up, sometimes it doesn't. I used to take it personal, but, bro, it's 8 billion people here. You think I got time to react to a damn uh, poll and reading every guy's all right, person number one said, Shaq, no. Like, bro, you think I have time to, like, mm -hmm. look at each and everyone's uh, uh, compliment or non-compliment about me? So I understand it, but we have to sometimes, and, and, and this goes for all of, you know, society. Just because yeah. a person thinks one way doesn't mean they're right or wrong, but it doesn't mean you have to belittle that person or, you know, talk about that person. Because we, as people, we don't stand on what we stand on. But I have a problem with, you, you know, what you said. Like, my thing is, doesn't matter who the goat is, my my guy should be in the conversation. Yes. Don't just don't just no, but hold on. So what Rashad was saying is like you guys just throw them out of the conversation. Like, you know, sometimes you have to listen to what people are saying. Like right now, and listen, you know, I love all all those guys. And I'm actually jealous that my name is not in the conversation more, but that's neither here nor there. So somehow it just went from Mike to LeBron and you just threw my guy out of the conversation. His name needs to be in there all the time. Mm -hmm. And when, and when his name is not in there, that's when people have a problem. I, I, please, I appreciate the correction, but let me ask yeah. you this question. I, as you sit there as a basketball analyst doing a great job that you do on TNT, you know, several nights a week during the NBA season, I've seen you on many occasions question certain things, and you're just talking about the game, and guys personalize it, and you're talking about basketball. You didn't insult them. You just talked about what they needed to do, how somebody else may have done it better, particularly in moments, because you ain't just looking at stats. You looked at moments. Knowing you the way that I have over these decades, you didn't just pay attention to numbers. You were talking about who showed up when it was time to show up, too. All of those things come into consideration. I look at Kobe. There is nothing on earth to question the greatness of Kobe Bryant, who to me is one of the greatest of all time. But it did help for those first three rings that he had you in your prime to some degree. That's not the point. The point everybody is making is don't leave him out the conversation. I'm not leaving him out the conversation. You are. You, you always say, How? oh, the, you always say goat, the goat is LeBron or Mike. No, I never okay. said it's LeBron. It's always okay. Mike. Okay. It's always okay. Mike for me. Well, I say him, listen, that, number I, two is LeBron. You, you're right. Okay. You're right, but you're right. But I always hear Mike. And LeBron, and I used to hear Mike and Kobe, and now it's Mike and LeBron. My right. thing is, it has to be those three guys. And if you want to get technical, Dr. J need to be in there too. No, because he started all this. No, ain't no no. No, ain't no, it no. Is Do no. I love Dr. Dr. J, J, but it's no. Hey, 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 Dr. J started all this. Okay, <laughs> he started, Dr. but that don't make him the goat though. And Magic. Yes, so, like, I had I had Magic okay. up in there too. I said, but that don't make him the goat. I got Magic all as the right. greatest point guard of all time. Listen. It doesn't matter, or it doesn't matter who you or I think the goat is. Okay. Certain people can be in a conversation. Certain people can't. Okay. And I just think, and I, and I just think, before y'all say one and two, you can't leave my guy out. So I can kind of understand why R Rashad was getting upset, yes. especially with Kobe not being here. You know, it just makes it. Like, and, and, and and you know, like I kind of heard what his point it was like. You just kind of throw him away. 
And, you know, we would never do that. And I know you would never do that. I would never I know do that. you and Kobe had a great relationship. Yeah. But his name needs to be in that conversation yeah. when you talk about the greatest of all but, time. But what I had to tell Rashad earlier was that Kobe and I had that conversation. Because I told Kobe. Because Kobe was like, what, what, what do you mean? I said, Kobe, I got Mike. You know what I'm saying? I got, I got LeBron who's been around quite a long time and is versatile with 6'9", 260 and all of this. I said, I look at Kareem. I look at Shaq. I look at Bill Russell. I said, when I, people used to get on me because I didn't bring up Wilt Chamberlain. Here was my issue with Wilt Chamberlain. You, your number one nemesis was Bill Russell. He had 11 titles. You had two. And that was your number one nemesis. So I'm not questioning the greatness of Wilt Chamberlain, but how can I put you against a dude that was your nemesis that's got nine more titles than you? So it's like, it's a basketball conversation, and that's all I'm saying. And that's something you and I talked about. Yeah, you got you could throw people in the conversation, but you got to make a decision. Remember I told you that? You got to make a decision, yeah. and you got to pick one. I picked and then, one. And then, uh, and then as a society, like... Like, me and you came into the game arguing, but we always had that respect for each other. Right. You, you wrote an article. I called myself jumping on you. Yep. You jumped back, and you told me why you wrote the article. And I was like, okay, watch this. <laughs> the next time I saw you, okay, big boy. But, like, so we we still could respect each other. And, you know, so I don't mind people having even heated conversations. So right. almost going to blows. But as long as the respect is there, I think this world would be a better place. Right now, you got a lot of disrespect and this and that. I agree. But again, I don't mind people talking about who their goat is, but you definitely got to have my boy in that conversation. I definitely will, yeah. and I definitely will. Shaq, I'm going to let you go for now, man. Happy New Year, big boy. Tex Johnson or Shaq? Is it, Chex, is it Tex Johnson or is it Shaq? Which one oh, is this, he? <laughs> this is Tex Johnson right here. Kai. Here we go, Cowboy. Here we go. Here we go, Cowboy. Here we All go. I want to know is this. Am I going to be able to find you when they lose next month? Yes. This month, I'm sorry. This month. Yeah. Am I going to be and able to I, find and, you? And, and, and listen, I'll tell you what. When we go to the Super Bowl, you can sit in the suite with me. I'm oh, gonna really? You're going to let me sit in the suite with you? You're you going to let me sit in the suite with you? Well, uh, hold, hold, hold on. Hold on, Chris. Hold on. Uh, Jerry Jones, this is Tech Johnson. If we make it to the Super Bowl, would you allow Stephen A to sit in the suite with us? Okay, sir. Thank you. Jerry Jones said he'll get back to me. Man, get the hell out of here, man. <laughs> I'll see you later, man. I'll see you later, man. They will lose right, this man, month. And, and they, they, they will lose before the month is over. It's nope. over. Okay? Nope. In January. It's coming. It's nope. just weeks away. It's just weeks away. Here we go, cowboy. Here we go. Bye, you, man. Brother. Appreciate you, bro. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. Why am I sitting here so happy? So in, I, I'm just loving life. I'm just loving life. Why? Because it wasn't just about great NBA action last night. You know what else it was about? It was about the Emmys. The Emmys. Now what on earth would more have to do with a daytime Emmy Award? especially as it pertains to that great soap opera General Hospital. I wonder what it could be. I wonder what it could be. Take a look. Our next nominee is known for his work as a sports commentator, but as you're about to see, he is so much more. Did you saw the tape? Hell no, but I saw people seeing it. And I gotta tell you, it took every bit of self-control I can muster for me not to take every one of them out. Please tell me you found out who did this. And the Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series goes to Stephen A. Smith, General Hospital. I'd like to thank the Academy, my family, and of course all the Brick fans out there. I couldn't have done this without you. I grew up watching GH. I had four older sisters, and when we came home from school, the TV was always on GH. Since I wasn't allowed to go outside until I finished my homework, I watched the show every single day growing up. And look at me now. I won an Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actor. Nice speech, Stephen A. <sighs> What's up, man? Yeah. There was just some fingerprints on this, you know? Mm -hmm. just, just wanted to try to shine it. What's going on, Mom? Oh, I'm just admiring your Emmy. GH has more gold than this one. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm. General Hospital holds the record for the most Emmy wins for outstanding daytime drama. It's won 15 times. 
but that's just for the show itself. There's writing, directing, acting, set design, lighting, hair, and makeup. GH has won a total of 132 Emmys. Not bad. Hey, man, the Emmy is like the Super Bowl ring of soaps, and GH is the GOAT. Tom Brady of daytime, to be exact. Maybe one day I'll be able to do that speech for real. But it must be tough to actually win when you do that. Oh, I have one. I have two. I have one. Does everybody on this show have an Emmy? I actually have three. <sighs> it's okay, buddy. One day. One day. No, oh, let it out. Bye. You okay? See, what's the moral of the story in all of this? You got aspirations. And the aspiration has to be visualized, okay? Before it can actually reach fruition. So yeah, I don't have an Emmy now. They got those. But I'm a part of the show. And you know something? I'ma speak it into existence. I don't know how. I don't know when. But someday, I too will legitimately get myself an Emmy. Speak it to existence. Speak it into existence. That's how it starts, ladies and gentlemen. That's how dreams come true. Congratulations to all my teammates at General Hospital, by the way, won seven Emmys just a few weeks ago. Congratulations, way to go. Great, great, great people. Love them all to death. Be back there next week. By the way, I'll be on the episode January 25th and January 26th. You could see me both days on General Hospital showing off a little bit of acting chops. Let's move on to some tweets before I get on out of here and get to the phone calls, rather, before I get on out of here. But before I do any of that, I got to touch on a couple of stories that y'all need to know about. Number one, I saw this story, and I just had to say something about it. So look, apparently, a pastor, a pastor, went into a McDonald's and then decided to attempt to make some of his own fried food using the cook after a worker quote unquote disrespected this man's wife the pastor Dwayne Waden allegedly attempted to throw the man in the deep fryer I mean Lord that's what happened okay now I will say this none of us should ever condone violence we got enough sick nonsense going on in our society today. But obviously, a pastor isn't usually associated with violence, so aberrations happen in life. If his wife, who was in training to be a manager for the local McDonald's, felt the need to call her husband to come there and check some young dude that was disrespecting her, and this man decided to put his hands around this man's neck and punch him in the face a few times. Yes, he was going to be arrested. Yes, he's in trouble with the police. Yes, there's video to support. They're arresting him. But if that man, a pastor, a man of God, decided to put his hands on somebody, that he must have really felt like his wife was being violated. So I don't know what kind of punishment is coming his way, but I'll bet you this, home life is going to be pretty nice for that man because he came to the aid of his woman. And I don't know too many women who don't love that. Next up, presidential candidate Nikki Haley. Apparently, she found herself in some hot water recently when she was asked about the reasons behind the Civil War. By the way, forgetting to mention the main reason, which was slavery. Well, on Thursday, just a couple weeks later, she attempted to clean up her answer of omitting slavery as a cause of the war by saying, quote, I have black friends growing up. I had black friends growing up. 
A lot of people are trolling her, getting on her, and what have you, and who knows how it's going to affect her in the polls because she was gaining some momentum, particularly going up against Ron DeSantis, when none of them are coming close to Donald Trump, by the way, but that's a different subject for another day. Let me say this to white folks out there who have black friends. When you say, I have black friends, that's very incriminating. You know why? Because white folks who usually say that are the ones who are accused of or perceived as having a problem with being friendly to black people. Now, I'm not saying that Nikki Haley is guilty of such a thing. She was the former governor of South Carolina, by the way. And I get that part. But I'm just saying even though some people can take it out of context, even some people incriminating her too excessively, the bottom line is just a lesson to be learned here. Don't use the black friends label. All it lets everybody know is that it's not something that you're accustomed to, it's an aberration. And because of that, it's justification not to trust you. If you are a Republican, if you're a, remember, if you're a member of the conservative right, here's a hint. There's an abundance of black folks out there who share your ideology and your ideological beliefs. Just be seen with them, hang with them. Like-minded folks in terms of their ideology, hanging out with one another, regardless of race, ethnicity, etc. If you just do that, that will go a long way. On far too many occasions, it's something I once told late Senator John McCain, God rest his soul, when he was running for election against Barack Obama. I said the biggest problem with the Republican Party is the fact that every time you see an abundance of them, it's only them around who happen to be white. You rarely see anybody black around them. I didn't say never, I said really. And I think former Speaker of the House, Mr. McCarthy, said it best, I don't know whether it was weeks ago or months ago. And he talked about looking at the Democratic Party and seeing a semblance of America. And looking at the Republican Party and seeing the most posh, affluent country club in America. I'm paraphrasing, but I believe I got that quote right. It's just something to think about. It's just something to think about. I'm a registered independent. So I flow either way, Republican or Democrat, but even though I'll be damned if I vote for a Republican, that's Trump. But you get what I'm saying. I hope you do. Let's go to the tweets before I go to the calls and get on out of here for the day. Let's go to this. James, at Caucasian James. I didn't write that. That's his Twitter handle, not mine. He says, do you like vodka Red Bulls? I neither like vodka nor Red Bulls. I think that if you need Red Bull, you're kind of cheating. What you looking for that kind of energy boost for? You don't have it? What you looking for the vodka for? What you like, spice it up? I mean, don't get me wrong. If it works for you, it works for you. But I'm saying, some people, when you say vodka, Red Bulls, if it was vodka or Red Bulls, that would be different. But the combination of both connotates something that you're clearly in need of. And it's not an alcoholic boost. It's something else. No, it's not how I roll. Next one. Let me get this next tweet up here. At the Kesh, the Kashafs, Shaf, Kashaf, Kalsi, what the hell is that? The K E S H A V K A L S I. <sighs> Some of y'all names, boy, I really wonder about y'all. Anyway, talk about Steve Kerr and his way of mishandling young talent. I didn't accuse Steve Kerr of mishandling anybody. What I said was the Kamin Jonathan Kamingas of the world, the Moses Moody's of the world, now the Pajemskis of the world. These young brothers can play, and it's good to see at least Kaminga and Pajemski in the lineup. The flip side to it is that when it comes to Kaminga and Moody, what's taking you so long? Joe Lacob, Peter Goober, and the rest of the ownership for the Golden State Warriors, former president of basketball operations Bob Myers, now it's the GM Mike Dunleavy Jr. When you look at this squad and this roster, everybody's been wanting to play young players. Steve Kerr has been reluctant to do that. At some point in time, when you've got these young boys 
in your lineup, in a uniform, particularly with an 82-game regular season schedule. The more you play them, the less you play some of the veterans, the more healthier and fresh the veterans are come playoff time as opposed to being spent. And I think even though he's a four-time champion, he's going to six NBA finals, and I think Steve Kerr has proven to be one of the top five coaches in the history of basketball, that is often a question I've had about him. It's literally the only question. What about the young bloods? When are you going to get them integrated into the system where they could play more time so they could give Steph Curry to Klay Thompson of the world and others their requisite West? And so much, to so much toiling doesn't have to be placed on their body. That's all I'm saying. That doesn't mean he's mismanaging young folks. It just means it's a legitimate question to ask as we look at Steph Curry, who's age 35, wondering how much time he's going to continue to be this great when you're playing him so many minutes and you're giving him so much time and you're not finding a way to spell for him. Next tweet. At underscore ask underscore Sebastian. Stephen A., are you into big, beautiful women? What's the largest lady you would ever be with? Hmm. Interesting question. For the record, I want people to be sensitive to this. I, ask, I answer these questions because y'all ask. And I don't even ask, answer most questions, okay? So I, asked, I answer these questions because I'm a man of the people. If you ask me a question, I'm going to give you an honest answer in most instances. I'm never going to lie, but in the same breath, I'm not going to answer every damn question. But I get a lot of these questions. So for every one that I accept, there's about 50 to 100 that I turn down because I don't have time and I'm not interested in answering all those damn questions. But to answer the second question first, I'm not my boy Pooley. Now, I've told you all about Pooley in the past. You ever saw that movie Norbit and you had the character Rasputia? You know, with all the blubber hanging off of her legs and her arms and stuff like that. I mean, just meat on top of meat. If she was wearing an outfit, you could see the cellulite through her jeans, stuff like that. That's him. A Rasputia who sat in the car and tilted one side. That's Pooley. That's not me. I like thickness. I don't like overweight. That's not me. To each his own, to each her own, to each their own. It doesn't matter. To me, that's my flavor. It's not about pounds. You could be 110 pounds. You could be 180 pounds. If you're solid and you have a figure, works for me. Plain and simple. That's how I am. But that's me. I know plenty of men who are different. I know dudes that you could have a backside as flat as the screen. They fine if you're healthy up top. I know dudes that you could have smaller breasts than mine, but you got a backside that could back up to the wall, and they good with that. My cousin Derek is about symmetry, symmetry. Nothing's too excessive. It's just right. That's him. Another one of my dudes, you could be that way, but you got really skinny legs. He's not interested. He wants them thick legs. It's the difference. One of my boys, he wants a red bone. He don't want a woman too dark, and he doesn't want a white girl. He wants a light-skinned girl. Another one of my dudes, if she was so dark he couldn't see at night, he'd love her. Everybody's got their own preference. Everybody got their own preference. Everybody's different. Okay? So you can't go by that. But to answer your question about the large lady, you don't go by the scale. You go by how it looks and how it fits. It's number one. Number two, does that mean, am I in the big, beautiful woman? Not really. I'm in the beautiful, voluptuous women. When you say big, that varies. Now let me get to the calls before I get on out of here for the day. 888-SAS-5303. That's 888-727-5303. To the calls we go. Let's go to Jake Ivy on the Clippers. What's going on? How you doing, Jake? Hey, Stephen. How you doing? I'm all right. Talk to me. What's up? I met you at the book signing in New York. I told you I was the only Clipper fan here. <laughs> wanted to hear your thoughts. I got you. wanted to hear your thoughts now with the big three finally blending in. Uh, next year, into a dome, opening day, 
Is it also banner raising night for us? Here's my problem with you, respectfully. Why the hell are you thinking about next year? Y'all have never been to a finals, let alone won a championship in NBA history. Why would you be thinking about next year at the new arena when you got a chance to win it right now? It's about right now. And I think this season, are you talking about winning now and hanging it up at the beginning of the next season? Is that what you were talking about? Yep, correct. My the apologies. My, I stand corrected. My apologies. Here's the deal. You got a chance. You got a chance. Because the Denver Nuggets are the favorites. They're a big team. They know how to play. They know how to win. They got the best player in the world in some people's eyes. There's no doubt about that. But Kawhi is a two-time champion. And when he's played over the last 11 or 12 games or so, they've won every game. Paul George is playing like a star. J James Harden has been terrific. So let's not forget what they bring to the table. And I can't say enough about Russell Westbrook. Russell Westbrook got a really, really bad rap when he was with the Los Angeles Lakers. I'm not saying he didn't deserve it or not. I don't know. I've heard conflicting stories from both sides, and I don't want to sit up there and throw shade on him. But in the same breath, I don't want to just take, you know, the side from his camp either. But I'm going to tell you this. Russell Westbrook in a Clippers uniform has been an incredible plus. I was so happy they re-signed him because he did a hell of a job for them last season. He did a hell of a job for them in the postseason when Kawhi went down. It wasn't his fault they lost. And, oh, by the way, once James Harden comes on board, for him to volunteer to come off the bench and for him to be the energizer bunny that he has been, I can't say enough about what Russell Westbrook means to this Clippers team. I'm telling you right now, and let me not forget Norm Powell. That brother could play, too, or Terrence Mann, and the coach in the Ty Lue. I'm not going to label y'all the favorites, but I'll tell you this. It wouldn't surprise me at all if the Western Conference Championship came down to the Clippers versus the Denver Nuggets. I will admit that. And I appreciate the call, man. Fuzzy in Vegas, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, Fuzzy? How are you? Good, man. Hey, congrats on first take having it the biggest year ever, man. Thank you. I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. What's up? Hey, last time that we spoke, I don't know if you remember, but you told the baseball community to shut the hell up. And then the baseball gods rewarded you with that first pitch. I just want to ask if the baseball gods are still listening, what's one thing you would change about baseball to get both Stephen A. Smith and ESPN to care about baseball a little bit more? Well, first of all, the younger audience. How about that? Um, the, the baseball guys were with me. I was clearly, I was clearly uh, uh, ill-informed in that regard because, <laughs> man, I, I got to tell you, Fuzzy, man, I spent, I threw 30 pitches in front of the Yankee dugout <laughs> from 60 feet, 6 inches, man, and I was throwing, at least 20 of them, I was throwing strikes. And I That's walked why I say up, the baseball and I walked, guys, I walked up on that up. hill. I walked up on that hill and I said, oh, <laughs> shit, what have I done? I couldn't believe how far away it looked. I said, oh, my God, I don't know if I'll reach home plate. That's how scared I got. I just, it's just a choke job on my part, just a choke job. Having said all of that, I would tell you this. To get more people interested in the sport of baseball, you do what Rob Manfred has already done. Major props to the MLB commissioner. Against tradition, against the old guard, against folks who are holding on to the times that used to be, changing the pitch count, changing the pitch clock, rather, changing shifting rules, infiltrating more running, more athleticism, more stolen bases, more RBIs, more runs scored, etc. That has infused the level of athleticism, and they haven't been averse to the personalities that have come with the sport. So because of that, you know, you flip the bat, it doesn't cause a brawl or anything like that anymore. Right. Guys are learning to deal with it, and you're infusing that young generation into the game. And as a result, it's not going to be perceived as a dying sport before long whose audience is fading into the twilight. You're going to get some youngsters interested in the sport. That's what needed to happen. That's what Rob Manfred did it. The baseball community did it because they were practicing it and testing it in the minor league system. I think what needs to be done, they've already been doing. And I think baseball is on its way up, and we're not going to ignore it. And I can assure you we're not going to ignore it during the baseball season when Mad Dog is there on Wednesdays with me. I can promise you that. Thanks a cool. lot. For hey, thank you, man. I appreciate it, Appreciate bro. it, man. Thanks, for it. Thanks a lot, man. Jorge, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, man? How you doing? Stephen A, happy new year and congrats on that Emmy, dog. Let's get it done. <laughs> no, I'll play it around. That was a, I wish I did hey, get an Emmy, I'll, but go I'll, ahead. <laughs> I was going to ask you about the Clippers, but since they already asked, yeah, I was interested. So do you think the NBA is ever going to compare to the NFL in ratings? I know they had the in-season tournament, and that was pretty cool. Nobody's going to compare. Nobody's, so nobody's going to compare with the NFL. 
NFL is king in the United States of America. You know why? Because they've established their sport as an event. You've got pastors yeah. changing, changing this, the times of their sermons, okay, so to make sure they don't miss games. You understand? Letting people yeah. out of church early, moving service time up so people can leave to get home, to get out in time for the games. You know, baseball is religion. Yeah. In the, I'm sorry, football, the NFL, is religion in America. That's the reason. 16, 17 games now over an 18-week period before the playoffs begin. And on top of it all, baseball is 162 games. Basketball is 82. Hockey is 82. So there's so many games. There's so much time. And then you got to think about the tailgate parties and stuff like that. Base football is an event. And it's the tailgate parties to the game itself. It's coming on on Thursdays. It's coming on on Sundays. It's coming on on Monday nights. Once the college football season expires before the college playoff and the bowl games begin, they're playing on Saturdays. I'm talking about, you're talking about a minimum of three days a week. Sometimes during the year, four days a week that you're getting football. And for each city, it's an event. And so when you look at it from that perspective, I don't think anything catches the NFL. But the NBA is pretty damn popular itself. And I don't think it's going to fade into the twilight. Its audience is growing as well because we've got a connection with that young niche. It's just that nothing is football, my man. Nothing is football. All right? Sure. Take it easy, my brother. All right, man. All right. Have a good one. That's it for today's edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. I hope y'all enjoy y'all week, and I hope you enjoyed this show. Thanks again to my man Brian Wintors from ESPN, and, of course, the one and only Shaquille O'Neal, the diesel himself. Really appreciate them giving me their time on this particular Friday. Thank y'all so much. I look forward to being back with y'all on Monday. It will be live from Houston, Texas, site of the national championship game between the Michigan Wolverines and the Washington Huskies. I will be coming at you live from Houston, Texas. So until then, peace and love, everybody. See you Monday. Much love to you. Be safe. Take care.